doesn't necessarily sell well with the bright lights in my face, but actually it's well enough, so it should be good. If I'm in your way and you want to see, just say, get out of the way, okay? All right, so who's here for a strength training for fat loss seminar? Everybody's here in the right place, right? Okay, <laughs> good, we're all on the right page here. So first of all, let's, let's just have some fun tonight, okay? Because if we can't have fun while we do this, what are we doing, right? It, it's, it's gonna, what do we call it, what I call it, suck. Um, when you get to work out, you want it to be fun, let's have fun here tonight. Can we all do that? Good, two people, right? Okay, so who am I? I can, can't read on there. So basically I want to talk about me real quick and just let you guys know you can trust me, okay? <laughs> um, so my, you guys can read that, can you see what that says? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. So what's my education, right? I have, uh, a BS in exercise science from Western Washington University, uh, master's in kinesiology from AT Still University. I graduated in 2012 with that. I am CSCS, which stands for Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist, which happens to be a test that's really well known in the industry. Like, if you have it, that means you're an awesome trainer. And I'll tell you what, they're probably right because I studied for three months to pass the test. <laughs> um, RTSM. Resistance Training Specialist Master. So this is really what sets me apart from, I guess, most other trainers. Um, my certification is apart from most other certifications. My ed education from uh, most other trainers. Um, that, if, if, for those of you that have trained with me, you've experienced it. You know, where it's like, oh, this has got a, he's got a little bit different perspective on things. And it's not about just killing me every single workout. Um, for those of you that train with me, can we agree with that? Yes? Okay. Courtney, you didn't raise your hand. You're in trouble. <laughs> okay. So as far as experience goes, I've been a trainer for over 10 years. Um, I've been self-employed for most of that time. I did start off at Nautilus as a corporate fitness trainer there, then went self-employed and eventually met here. I have over... The internet's off now. I have over... <laughs> Thumbs up, right? Oh. 
Okay. So, so we are here to take, well, I'm going to try to beat you guys, to take the red pill. Okay? And the reason why I brought this up is because when it comes to fat loss, what is the number one thing people want to do? What do they want to do as far as exercise is concerned?
you exercise, even just a little bit, you can create that deficit. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If we all want small or big deficits. Big. Big? Why do we want big? <laughs> we want to lose weight yesterday. Right? Okay? So we do a bunch of exercise. And then we say, well, we also need to starve ourselves. Right? So there's a little problem there. And we'll get into that. But um, the thing is, you've got to have a balance of the two. Okay? And that's really what it comes down to. Balance is, I wish I had a little clicker that I could do. Yeah. And if I'm in here, we've got some way, just let me know. Okay, so there's other important factors that can actually affect fat loss, and sleep is one of them. Um, you know, the CDC recommends that you get seven to nine. Personally, I prefer like 11 or 12, um, but I got kids, so usually six or seven. Um, so lack of sleep can, can hinder your results. So can sleep apnea. Um, I just actually watched this guy named Dr. Spence Nadalski do a presentation. And he's, it was on medical, medical things that can hinder your weight loss. And sleep apnea was one. He, and he gave a couple examples, really cool. So he had a, two clients that he gave examples of that were, worked out for like six, or I'm sorry, uh, two, two months, doing everything right. And they hardly saw any results. So they did a sleep test on them. They found out they had sleep apnea. Give them a CPAP machine, within 30 days they're reached down to 10 pounds. So sleep is a big factor. Um, and it's not just how many hours of sleep you get to, it's, it's the, uh, the quality of sleep. So, you know, if you're like a restless sleeper, like, like I am because I got a newborn and every friendly noise he makes wakes me up, right? So I have to get more sleep to make up for that. And then we have stress. Stress is the silent killer. So this one's huge because we don't know what's really ha happening. Um, a lot of times we don't know stress is affecting us until it's too late. And at that point, it slaps us in the face because we say, well, heart attack. Or we go to the doctor and they say, you got really high cholesterol, you gotta do something about this. Um, there's a really cool, uh, I saw a slideshow one time, and it had three different people on there. One that had a really crappy diet, got everything else was good, but a really crappy diet. So, had some cholesterol issues, right? Had another person who had exercised and ate well, which of course they were clear. Then they had another person who exercised and ate well, but was really highly stressed. Which one do you think had the most cholesterol? The one with the stress, yeah. It's a very, like, again, like I said, they call it the silent killer. Um, genetics, but genetics plays a big role. Um, I'll take, and it can differ from brother to brother, sister to sister, brother to sister. Take me for example, I've never really struggled with my weight. You know, I struggled with my beer consumption, but not my weight. Um, but my older brother, now he struggles with his weight. He weighed, outweighs me by 100 pounds. And I tell you what, if he just looks at food, it goes right there. So it's really frustrating him. Now, he might have a genetic makeup that does not allow him to look like a bodybuilder. So what is he going to have to do? Most likely he's just going to have to kind of get over it. Right, and be okay with who he is. Um, so really, it's, it's maximize your own potential. You know, we always want to compare ourselves to everybody else because that's what again what we sold. Beachbody says you can look like this person, you can look like me. You open up any muscle and fitness magazine, or what I call muscle and fiction, and you can see you know get six inches on your arm in, in six minutes. You know, or uh, I guess they had eight minute abs at one point, now it's seven minute abs. I'm just going to call it seven second half or something like that. Um, so really, comparing yourself to yourself, right? Okay, uh, medications. There are certain medications out there that, especially like thyroid medications or um, postmenopausal medications that will make almost the other possible to lose weight. So if you're on medications, having a hard time losing weight, that could be something that needs to be looked at. Leptin. So is everybody familiar with leptin? Yeah, no? Okay, so it's a hormone in your body that regulates the fat storage, okay? So it's constantly telling your body, okay, do we have enough fat storage? Do we not have enough? Do we need more fat storage? Do we need to take away, okay? Without this hormone, it makes it darn near impossible, again, to lose fat, no matter what you do. So there's things like, like Courtney and I have done where, you know, she just had a, a trip uh, recently that she wanted to get in, in good shape for, so she was working really, really hard. 
apartment every now and then, I said, okay, no, no exercise. And go home and eat what? Eat whatever you want. Yeah, or a big fat steak, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay? And what that does is that gets this, this hormone here regulated. So every now and then, through this weight loss process, you're going to have to do what they call a refeed to get this thing back to where it should be. Because the more you do that whole big calorie deficit thing I was telling you about, the deeper that is and the harder you're working out, the less that's being produced. And that, guess what? You're going to have a really hard time losing weight. Okay? So, hashtag Lardio. You guys are, you know, tweeters around here. Um, Lardio is a term that I have created because it really defines what we're doing when we do cardio. We're trying to lose fat, which is also lard, okay? So if you've been training with me, you've probably heard that term. Um, so what it is, is it's a fat loss accelerator, okay? So the reason how that works, again, it's a lot of thermodynamics. If you are on a Lardio machine, you are burning what? Calories, okay? So you are increasing or, in fact, creating that caloric deficit. So it is useful. But we're going to talk about some of the limitations to it, okay? So steady state versus HIIT, which is the high intensity interval training. Um, again, a lot of freaking thermodynamics, okay? You guys, I guess you remember that by now. You guys leave here and forget about it. Um, uh, bad things are going to happen. So, there's a big argument out as to which one is more effective, okay? And I say it doesn't really matter because, again, it's coming down to that simple one, one simple thing. The law of thermodynamics, calories in versus calories out. You guys ever heard of the afterburn? You know, how many, you know, you, you, okay, so how long have you been told or, or I guess, been sold uh, that the afterburn effect lasts? Okay, so you're actually closer than, than what's actually generally sold because a lot of times you'll hear 48 to 72 hours and that's that's literally impossible. It does last an hour or two if you're extremely out of shape. The more in shape you get, the less that lasts because you recover faster. Okay, so that's why I put hard. Is it an afterburn effect? Yes, but how much does it really account for? Not much. Um, next, so the advantage of the high intensity interval training is that it is a time saver. So no one Lardio uh, is better than the other unless you're lacking time, okay? Because what's the number one reason that people don't exercise? Time. You're wrong. You know why? Because it isn't time. It's how you choose to spend your time, okay? Yeah. All right. So it, it's how you choose. We all have the same amount of time. But let me, let me tell you this. Would you rather, I don't know, on a hot summer day, be sitting out on a raft, enjoying yourself, or be at work. Which, which would you rather do? Pretty obvious, right? Most of us do go to work because we have to. But we have to do that because we choose that's important enough for us to do for our family and things like that. To do the things we want. So really, it comes down to how you choose to spend your time. Now, that's why with this whole strength training thing and whole fat loss thing, it has to be something actually enjoy, which is something I really strive hard for with my clients. Um, does that make sense to you guys? Okay, so it is the time. It, it's how you choose to spend it, and it's got to be worth it, right? <clears throat> so the fat burning zone. You guys have all heard of this, right? Okay, so basically if you work out at a certain percentage of your maximum heart rate, you'll burn more fat calories. You guys all familiar with that? Okay, I'm also here to tell you that is wrong. It's a fallacy, and I'm going to show you how right now. Okay, so we're going to do fat burning zone versus not fat burning zone, okay? And see how this turns out. If you're doing fat burning zone, you're usually working somewhere around the 60% of your maximum heart rate, which is usually like your, your heart rate's up, you're sweating, you might be breathing a little bit heavy, but you're definitely not out of breath, and you could carry on a conversation to call it the talk test. Okay, so I'm doing that, I feel bad because I'm standing here as well, I'm standing here um, is that you, you will be burning half your calories from fat and half from carbs. You're going to be burning about eight minutes, uh, eight calories per minute, okay? So after an hour of exercise, let's see how that plays out. 
So you got 480 calories burned total. 240 of those come uh, fat, right? 50%. Now, let's look at the uh, not uh, fat burning zone. Let's go a little more intense. So 80% of your maximum heart rate, which is probably, I would say, it would be tough for most people to keep that, that up for an hour, but we want to compare apples to apples, right? So here you're actually burning less percent of your calories from fat. So it's really kind of, it's kind of looking good for the fat burning zone, right? Um, however, you're going to be burning three calories more per minute, so you're 11 per minute. So after an hour, you're looking at 640 total calories burned, 264 calories from fat, okay? So even though you burn a lesser percentage of fat, you burn overall more fat calories, okay? So we've all been lied to, right? So now, I think they got it wrong with this really, I guess it should be called the fat burning zone, burning fat more, right? But again, it doesn't really matter, okay? Because what matters more, you guys right now, you guys are all, every single one of you, are all in the fat burning zone right now. When you sleep, you're in the fat burning zone. When you're at your desk, you're in the fat burning zone, okay? So I remember learning that in college, and I was, I was <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me, because my uh, physiology professor was going over these numbers, and she's saying, so when you are sitting there at rest, you're burning a high percentage of calories from fat. I'm like, well, that's, that's good. Why don't I just sit around all day? <laughs> you know, like, this is perfect for my goal. Um, but, you know, again, what, they, what she wasn't telling me was this whole calories in versus calories out thing. Because I can easily, easily eat more calories than I can burn while I'm sitting around doing nothing. Right? We can all do that. Okay? I'm probably going to be doing that tonight. Okay. Strength training and fat loss. Now we're getting into the meat of the subject here. So, this here is a girl that I met in Kansas City a couple weeks, about three weeks ago, okay? So how many of you would say that she looks bulky and huge and like she could lift a thousand pounds? Right, she looks pretty good, right? Okay, she can deadlift 262 pounds, which is a heck of a lot of weight. I didn't do more than that, but I'm just <laughs> um, So we're gonna kind of get into this whole bulky thing, you know, with women. I just want to show you, give an example. You know, lifting weights doesn't mean you have to get bulky. So strength training women. Now girls, do not worry. Like I said, you're not going to turn into a sheep. Okay? <laughs> this does not happen. <clears throat> um, and even if it did, well, there's, there's living fat. Okay? So your genetics, your genetic potential is going to determine if you're going to be bulky or not. There are some women who are just bulky, period. I remember uh, when I worked out at the YMCA, when I first moved to Vancouver, Washington, there was a female uh, fitness director there, and her calves were about three times as big as mine, and I had big calves. She was just a bulky lady. There's no way around it, okay? Um, we all heard the testosterone, uh, testosterone argument, right? You guys don't have as much testosterone, so you can't get bulky like guys. Okay, well, that's if you want to get bulky like a guy. Well, that's true. We're not comparing them to guys, right? <coughs> the thing you gotta remember is you can get bigger. Your muscles can grow. Okay, and in some people's eyes, that may 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 make them think that you're bulky. Okay, I got a, I got a funny story about this. When I was working for Bowflex, I was selling Bowflex machines over the phone, and I started in the winter. So when the spring came, people started wearing short sleeves, right? And there's this girl who came in. She wore her sleeves up like this, and I was like, wow. So I told her, I said, man, you got butt arms. And she looked at me like this. You know, and she's like, you don't ever tell a woman you have butt arms. I'm like, sorry. Okay. Yes, next time I was like, yeah, next time. It's totally different, right? Um, besides, bulky is a judgment. Okay? I'll give you another example. There's a lady that uh, I know on Facebook, she was talking about this. And she measured her arms around. 12 inches around, okay? Then she started lifting weights, started losing some fat, and her muscles started appearing, okay? So someone told her, you got bulky. Guess what? She measured her arms around, they were down a half an inch. Bulky is a judgment. It's the same thing as the difference between a weed and a flower, right? It's a judgment. 
don't know about you guys, but if I look out in the field and I see a bunch of dandelions, I think it's kind of cool. My wife hates it. You know, I see them yellow. It looks yellow. I'm like, me, I'm a Packers fan. I have a little green. Who <laughs> said that? Someone not a Packers fan? <laughs>
Okay, here we go. Yeah, sort of true. Okay, so can anybody tell me how many calories a pound of muscle burns in a single day? Nobody. What's that? No. Okay, so you generally nobody knows this because it's not talked about. They just say more muscle, more calories, right? Are you guys sitting down? Because I have some news for you. It burns six calories a day, one pound of muscle. So what that means is, you put on 10 pounds of muscle, you burn 60 calories, great. You get an extra Oreo cookie or something like that, right? So it doesn't make that big a difference in the overall grand scheme. You know, long term, it could, but however, when that muscle is active, that's when it's really doing its work, okay? And we're gonna kind of get into how that plays in the whole fat loss game. So again, it doesn't burn much. What they do is to find that out, is they say, okay, we're gonna take you and here's your muscle mass, and what we're gonna do to see how many calories this, this burns, you're gonna sit in the bed all day and not move. Right, so it's not really real life, it's a sterile environment. So when we move, things change, and it gets really hard to, uh, to control and then really figure out what we can burn. All right, <clears throat> another myth: strength training is not lardia. Okay, uh, Maggie, do you agree with that? No. Okay, why is that? <laughs> That's right, it is both. Okay, so how many people here have done a really hard set? Like 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 it was like what I was doing over there. And did you get up breathing heavy? Yeah. Right? Did it take you a little bit to recover from that? Okay? That's large. Okay? Now think about it this way. We got high intensity interval training is what? A period of going really fast and then a period of rest. Okay? And we repeat that. Think about, well, let's just take bench press, for example. We do a really hard set of 10, then we what? We rest. Then we what? Repeat that, right? So it has the same effect as high-intensity interval training if you're pushing that hard. All right, unstable surface training. Now, I want to talk about this real quick um, because, one, it's, it's what I see a lot and then also what is, is kind of taught in the quite a bit. Um, Courtney, can I get you to come up here real quick? Yes. Okay. So, what do we know about unstable surface training? What, what are we told that it requires you to use more muscles, right? So you burn more calories. It works your core better. All these things, right? So what research has found, really, when you get on unstable surface, that it can reduce your muscle force output by up to 44%. It means you're using less muscle, which means you're burning less what? calories, okay? And it's also going to affect your force output. So when it comes to balance training, how many people have a problem, generally speaking, keeping their balance like this? Not many. It's when we're moving, right? So we're moving, and like when I went to school uh, at Western, the whole campus was layered, like floored with bricks. And bricks, when they get loose, they tend to pop out and bite you, right? So we have to be able to force and balance back up. We have to produce power. And if we're on unstable surfaces and that power is going down, we have an increased risk of fall. Okay? But also, let's talk about this core work, and this is what I really want to talk about. Spread your feet like this, and try to let me push you over, okay? So I'm going to do this, okay? So it takes me quite a bit to move her, okay? So how much opportunity did this right here, your stomach muscles, your core muscles, have to, to produce force, say, versus put your feet together, all the way together, versus that. Which one gave her the opportunity to produce most force? Often one? Yes. Can we agree with that? Okay, good, pretty simple, right? So, which, in which scenario do you think she's going to use more energy to stay upright? Right. Scenario one. Okay, so now if we go on one foot, Right? Really easy. Okay? So go ahead and sit down. Thank you. Um, so the whole point of that is maybe being on unstable surfaces it isn't doing what you're doing. Okay? It may seem hard. The perceived exertion might be there, but what's really happening in the underlying reality probably isn't. Okay? So the top three reasons you need strength training in your life. Okay? So number one, maintains muscle mass when in a, when in a caloric deficit. Now, when you're in a caloric deficit, your body needs energy to sustain itself. 
okay? And it can take from whichever where it wants. What comes off easier, protein or fat? Protein, right? So if you don't give your body, you guys ever heard that, like, if you turn, if you don't use it, you lose it, okay? So if you're not giving your muscle, your body a reason to keep your muscle around, and it needs energy real fast, it is going to do for a muscle. You know what's called? Uh, being catabolic, okay? Okay, so it makes your cardio more effective, okay? So remember, we talked about when you gain muscle, you actually burn more calories, but burn more calories when it's active or inactive? Active, okay? So if you insist on doing cardio, Lardio, and you want it to be more effective, you gotta, you gotta do strength training. Okay. It will increase your color for a dramatic Go ahead. What is cardio? Uh, it's just cardio for the purpose of fat loss. So when I say it, just think cardio. Yeah. Um, the other thing too, and I forgot to mention this, or maybe it's coming up. But, uh, okay, so it makes you burn more calories when not exercising. Okay? Isn't that neat? You guys ever heard of neat? It's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Okay? So I used to think, like, you know, you always heard that park in the back of the parking lot, take the stairs instead of the elevator. How many calories you really burn, right? Not, and if you're in shape, it's, it's actually less dramatic than if you're not in shape. So at the beginning of the stage of your fat loss journey, those things become more important than towards the end. Now, research, I read some research on this, so it did it, 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 it a mind blow thing, okay? It can account for anywhere between 500 to 1,000 calories in a single day. This whole fidgeting, taking the stairs, taking the, you know, walking instead of, um, right, you know, when you come to the gym, trying not to get to the front, right, to work out, right? Um, all those things, uh, like if you're sitting down and, you know, like, like what I do a lot, like, I do that whole, you know, let's get it, more calories. It can actually make a difference. Do you think 500 to 1,000 calories a day can make a big difference in your fat loss? Okay. And strength training more muscle when you fix it, it's going to make you burn more calories that way. Okay, top five other reasons. Now, again, this doesn't have much to do with fat loss, but they are important reasons of strength training. Uh, osteoporosis prevention. Okay, it's the number one way to prevent it or treat it. Your body builds bone by having to deal with force, and when you're tugging on your muscles by lifting weights, it says we need stronger bones. Less arthritis pain. Now, this always weird to me because I thought, you know, when you have arthritis and your bones are kind of grinding, I can't see how that would help. But what they're finding out through pain research is that your brain doesn't send that signal anymore because it's saying, you know what, we're not in danger. So strength training can help with that. Effective treatment for diabetes, which again, I thought that was pretty interesting because I did not know that. Um, reduce the effects of sarcopenia. Anybody know what sarcopenia is? It's age-related, it's natural muscle wasting. So as we get older, our muscles start to deteriorate on us naturally, unless we give it a reason to stay through strength training. Okay? Cardio can help a little bit with the lower body, but there's absolutely nothing for the upper body, uh, generally speaking. Increased cardiovascular health. Okay? So this uh, researcher, Stu Phillips, is out at Master University in, in Canada, or what I call Canada. Um, he, uh, He's one of the foremost researchers out there in the world, actually, on this whole thing. He did this review of the research and found that strength training actually, actually health-wise, health-related speaking, not necessarily performance, is just as effective, strength training is just as effective for cardiovascular health as cardio training is. Which is kind of cool, because we're not taught that, right? Okay, so strength training for balance. So we're going to kind of get into the how-to, okay? And you guys gotta remember, I'm giving you guys kind of the general outline of things. Um, if you wanted something specific, you guys would train with me, you know this, I have a really hard time giving out plans that somebody I don't know nothing about. Um, but these are some guidelines that you guys can take home and start implementing in your own life. So the big thing is just freaking do it. You know, and don't be scared of it, because I see it especially, I hate to go on but a lot of times, like Maggie did this at when we first started it about a year ago. You know, were you comfortable going into the gym at first? Not at all. You know, I mean, I see people do this all the time. They walk in and they, you know, they 
to see all these machines and they're like, most things. I actually saw someone one time walk in like, oh, it's one of those things. Um, I don't really care if you know what you're doing or not. Get in there and do it. If you need help beyond that, say in there to help you. Same too if you're helping. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be complex or confusing. By the way, when we talk about this whole confusing thing, all I can think of is muscle confusion. Okay? You guys heard this term? Okay. You guys know that muscle confusion does not exist. It, your muscle can't get confused unless all of a sudden it thinks it's a different muscle or something like that. Um, so it doesn't exist. That's a term that Tony Gordon created for each body. To be okay. Okay. So we call it pseudoscience. Um, so there's this thing called the theory of self-efficacy, which I, I just learned about this. It's something I've been doing. I just had no idea what the term was. And what that means is do something that or get comfortable with something, okay? So for everybody that's trained here with me, you guys can attest to this, because the first workout probably didn't feel like you were doing much of anything at all, right, Shelly? No. Okay, uh, I can tell, I can tell you, it's like, you were going to feel like you didn't work out today, okay? And like Shelly, the same kind of way, so that's not doing anything, right, right? Well, we gotta get you comfortable with it. When you got comfortable with it, was it easier to add on something new? Yes. It was it easier to work out in front of a people? Big time, okay? So that's the theory of self-efficacy. So there are key differences for fat loss, when you're strength training, for fat loss versus trying to gain muscle. And that comes in magnitude and rest period. So how much weight are you actually lifting? Load, magnitude, and how long are your rest periods? Okay, so if you, Courtney, we just made a switch, right? You're training, and, and Kathy, too, you know? And so they both said we want to start gaining some muscle. So one of the problems we have is they want to do something, move on to the next thing. It's like, you know, I'm going to tell Kathy, I'm like, I can see her. She gets done with a, a set, and she's like, what? <laughs> 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 you know, and so I'm like, sit it down right? um, So because she's trying to build muscle, her muscle, we hit a hard set, her muscles need time to recover so they can respond again for the next set. Because load is what is going to make the muscle adapt for those purposes. Now. If it was fat loss, and Courtney even tested this too, shorter break periods, right? Sometimes no break at all. Sometimes we hook up that leg extension or leg press machine with bands on it and see how many reps we can get in 30 seconds or to puke, which I've only had two pukers in my time. I'm gonna get you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so those are the two biggest differences. Otherwise, really, it doesn't really matter because what is going to make the biggest difference in your fat loss efforts anyway? Calories in versus calories out. Right? Can't forget that. If you guys do not adhere to that, it doesn't matter what you do, you will not lose fat. Okay? So even though this is strength training for fat loss, it should be beyond calories in versus calories out strength training for fat loss. Okay? So you got it here to rule number one. Alright, so a few guidelines. When it comes to strength training, you want to do it at least two times a week. If you do that, full body workouts are going to be best. Okay? Most of my clients start off two times a week doing full body workouts, and then we progress into three times a week doing upper body, lower body split, although you can do full body workouts at a time. Now, if you're going to do two times a week full body workouts, make sure you give yourself at least three days rest. So for instance, if you work out on Monday full body, the next time you, oh, you will allow yourself to work out will be Thursday, okay? Or you can do it Friday. So it's gotta be at least three days in between that. When you're doing the upper and lower body split, you can do like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Because it'll, from Monday to Friday, you have five days of rest there between the body parts. Does that make sense, guys? And how long are those periods of working out? Is it a half an hour, an hour? If you're doing like two days a week. Yeah, uh, generally I like about a half hour. You know, like I said, it doesn't take it doesn't take much. You could go in there, do one set, maybe even two, especially if you're just starting. Okay, one to two sets and do 10 to anywhere between 10, uh, 8 and 12 reps um, on, each, on each one. Now once you build up, the big thing there is going to be doing 8 to 12 hard reps, okay? Um, <clears throat> but most of my clients, I think everybody, you know, all my clients are doing half hour sessions. They'll start off with an hour because I like to talk, right? So they have to talk. Um, okay, so with the whole reduced rest periods, 
it's, it's effective for balance, which is why circuit training, if you're going to compare apples to apples, so you take this group who eats the same stuff as this group, but this group did circuit training and this group did just general strength training, the circuit training group will out edge in fat loss terms or weight loss terms the group that did do circuit training just a little bit. Okay? But the big thing is just just like I said, just bring the just lift some weights. Oh yeah, combos and complexes. Um, I'm gonna give away three of these books today, but uh, Nick Tumanello talks about that in this book. You can actually get it off Amazon for about 15 bucks. It's a really, really good book. Really simplifies the process and will give you directions on how to go from point A to point B. Um, but he talks about combos, combination exercises, which is taking one movement and you know making it two, two exercises, and making it one movement. You know, so like you could take a bar to here and stand up and then lift it like that it would be a combination. Complexes would be. Um, Taking two exercises and like like we do uh, supersets sometimes, so we do curls and straight into triceps kind of thing. Um, so adding Lardio to your workout, okay? It, like I said, it can be effective. It is a fat loss accelerator, but it is your ace in the hole. It is not what you do to cause fat loss, right? It's what you do to accelerate it. Again, I'm gonna repeat: What will cause fat loss? Calories in versus calories out. That's not what I heard. Um, okay, so use it sparingly. And, and really, what it comes down to is you want to start with the least amount of work possible and the most amount of calories as possible to get your desired result. Okay, so use cardio as the so start with a little bit and see how that works. So maybe two days, thirty minutes a piece. Not losing weight. Okay, are the calories in check? Yes. Right? Okay, so let's add a little more cardio, add another day. Maybe maybe 30 minutes, maybe 10 minutes. I don't know. Do you lose weight there? No. Okay. Well then you just keep adding until you start losing weight. And at that point, you want to stop. Okay? Until you hit a plateau, which then you can reach your ace in the hole, add a little bit of cardio, and get yourself a little movement. Okay? Because what happens is we all, again, like I said earlier, we all want to start with this much exercise and eating this many calories, right? Big difference. We're going to burn out and we're going to overtrain. Okay, and that's one of the things you got to be cautious with when it comes to Marty. Um, again, don't overdo it because it does lead to overtraining. So do the type of cardio you enjoy most. Because I get asked all the time, like, what's the best cardio for fat loss? Well, what kind of cardio do you like? I like this. That's the best for fat loss. Because what it comes down to is adherence. What are you more likely to do? Again, it's all about that having fun thing, right? I'm trying to burn through this a little bit here. We can them all the time. <clears throat> okay, so take a sustainable approach. All right. Again, this whole thing really comes down to sustainability. Okay, because if you can't sustain what you've got, what are the chances of you keeping it up? What are the chances of you even wanting to keep it up? It's pretty little, pretty, very, very slim, very few people. Which is one of the problems with the prospects is they're just go, 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 right? And then you get to where you want to be, and then you start hating, and then you say, man, I just I can't get myself up to work out today. You know, I can start with Kathy this week, and that's one of the things she said. I just come here, I burn myself to the ground. I'm having a hard time getting motivated sometimes. So I said, don't work out every single day, right? So now it's just three days, right? It's right, right? Yes. Which she was doing fine, okay? Um, don't expect perfection either, okay? This is a tough one, right? Being perfect. Just like, don't talk. Um, okay, what happens is we say, okay, man, we're doing really good. I ate good. I worked out. I have strength training. I've done all these things. And then five days later, man, I had a social event. I'll tell you what. <laughs> um, I way over drink my calories, right? So what that causes people to do is they say, oh, I might as well just and they go home, park the car in the garage, shut the door, and start back up. Over one day. Okay? So remember the 80 20 rule. Try to be good 80% of the time. 20% of the time, screw off. Right? Um, you know, you also hear it as 85, 15, 90, 90. I don't really care what it is. But try to do good at least 80% of the time. Enjoy.
enjoy yourself, okay? <laughs> if there's anything I like to do in life, it's enjoy myself, okay? Um, this was back in 2007, and I was on the Columbia River. I was in pretty decent shape. I did not stop drinking beer all the time. Those of you that know me, I love my beer, okay? And so if, what I need to do, keep in mind, is I want to be able to stay healthy, stay fit, all this kind of stuff, but I gotta do it in a way that I enjoy, okay? I'll give you a couple more examples of some, some clients that I train. <clears throat> Lori Kendall, this is stretching out from the movie you were in justice, but here, she was, you know, not necessarily overweight or anything like that, but she wasn't very happy with the way she looked. She said, I want to do a, a bodybuilding show or a figure show. And there, there's 12 weeks difference. Okay? 43 years old, beat females that were in their 20s and had wine at least three times. Aaron Hendrick, I don't have a this before picture, but he wasn't necessarily, you know, out of shape before any of this, but did, did a bodybuilding show. <clears throat> Got in the best shape of his life, age 40. Ate pizza, a whole pizza on my floor, every Friday. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. To me, that gets me excited. To know that I don't have to bust my ass and give up the things that I love. Okay, when we're making some sacrifices, absolutely. But do we have to give everything up? Absolutely not. And I tell you what, without strength training, this doesn't happen. I promise you that. Okay, so any questions real quick? Okay, so we're gonna do the drawing, go ahead. Okay, I've always heard that one to two pounds a week is a healthy fat loss, or just weight loss, would you agree with that? Yeah, I generally shoot for about one. 